Well, again, good morning, and it is good to have you here in the Lord's service, and it is good to have the Word of God, amen? It is good to get to go to the Word of God, to study it in depth, and um, see what God wants us to do in our lives, see, see what decisions He wants us to make in our lives, and I pray that we are ready for that today. I pray that we are um, have ears ready to hear, and, and when that word of hear is, is said, it's, it means hear and ready to obey. So today, I hope that we are ready to hear what the Word of God says and that we are ready already to obey. I hope that we are ready to allow the Holy Spirit of God to convict us, to teach us, to guide and direct us today. I guarantee you it will affect every area of your life with what you do with the message today. Before we read scripture, let's bow to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you today. Thank you so much for being the good, good Father that you are. We have great fathers that love us, that care for us, that teach us, that are there for us, and that even give us what we need in this life. But you are the greatest Father ever. You have uh, our interest and our best in mind. You actually know exactly what is best for us. And through your word, you are desiring to teach us. You are desiring to show us how to live. You are desiring to show us a way of life and the abundant life that you are wanting to bless us with. May we, though, now just come to you with our minds, with our hearts, with our lives, with our hands open to you, with whatever your will is today that you show us that we will be ready to obey, that we will be ready to repent if, the, if need be, and that we'll be ready to say, I want your will, not mine anymore. If there's someone here, though, that's even lost, that has never trusted in Christ as their personal Savior, we pray that today will be that day that they're saved, that they choose to trust in Christ as their personal Savior. Please be with me as I preach. Let your word clearly be shared but all of us as we receive and respond to your word, in Christ's precious name we do pray. Amen. Where we're going to look today is Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 9. You can entitle the message today, Parents Do and Teach the Word of God. So the message to parents today is for us to do and to teach the Word of God. You could also entitle this, if you wanted to, Pass the Faith on to the Next Generation that we are to pass the faith on to the next generation. I'm going to read the first three verses, and we'll, we'll, we'll bring out some thoughts as we go through there. And after we read these first three, three verses, it will gear us into the direction for the rest of our study today. But it says this. It says, no, uh, excuse me, now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. We'll pause there for a moment. This is the word, this is the command of God, Almighty God, amen. And the original audience that is being spoken to here um, was the Israelites, after they had been, get this, brought out of slavery through the miraculous hand of Almighty God. They were in hundreds of years of bondage in Egypt. Cruel bondage. And God heard their cry and delivered them. Amen? And did so with mighty works. And did so out of love for them. But guess what? We're going to see this later in the Scripture he didn't just bring them out of Egypt. He was bringing them into the promised land. My friend, for you and me, that Egypt can represent sin and the world. My friend, before I was saved, let me just tell you, I was in bondage to sin and I was lost in the world away from God and so were you. Amen? But by the grace of God, through Jesus Christ alone, I didn't just get delivered out of bondage in Egypt, but He has delivered me for a purpose. He is leading me to the promised land. 
And what that picture is for us today is He is leading you and He has in store for you the abundant Christian life. He came to give you life and life more abundant. A full life. A victorious life. And my friend, let me just tell you, what happened with those there, they came out of Egypt. But because they lacked faith, they didn't go into the promised land. A whole generation died in the, prom- in, in, in the wilderness. They failed to walk by faith onto what God was promising and giving them. Let me just tell you, my friend, we might, I hope we don't at least forget this part. But if we forget the Lord and what he's done for us, we will forget this part. That you have been bought out of sin. Bought out of bondage. I hope we haven't at least forgotten that part. But if that's the only part that we remember and that we know, let me just tell you, we're going to waste a lot of years wandering in the wilderness and never get around to marching forward in victorious, abundant life as Christians. Do we hear that? He saved us, but he saved us for something. And we're going to see a little bit of what that something is today. So again, he, he, is, he has them now. He's, Deuteronomy is known as the reteaching of the law. Repeating the law, let us remember what your parents forgot and failed to walk by faith in I'm reminding you because you're at the border of the promised land that I have given you. I've given you that victory. Now I want you to walk forward by faith. But let me remind you of my word for you. If you want to be successful and stay in that land, you need to know my word and my will for you and you must do it. That's what this is saying to us here. He's reminding them of these commands. And he, he, he is saying um, that you may do them uh, in the land that you are going into. I want you to live the word of God. Is that our desire today? Are we ready to live the word of God? Not just halfway hear it and then leave and do nothing with it. But no, I mean hunger for it. Take it to heart and say, God, I'm ready to live it. What's said next in verse 2? It says that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I commanded thee. So again, he wants, you to comm- he wants you to obey all of what he teaches you. As Christians, my friend, we're not to just pick and choose commands in the word of God and say, yep, I like that one. That one don't seem so bad. Well, that one doesn't look like I got to give up so much of what I have now. I'll obey that one. No. Take the full word of God and let's live it by faith. What does he say next? Get this. So again, he's reminding you today of his word and his plan for you that you may live it, but it doesn't end there. He says, which I commanded thee, get this, thou for you, for thy son, and thy son's sons all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. What did he just tell us? What did God just tell you just now? I have, a, I have my, my word for you that thank the Lord he has given us, that thank the Lord he has preserved for us today, and you have it at your fingertips. But guys, he is saying this, I have a word and a way of living for you that you should live in it and by it. Reflect on our lives today. Is that where we are today? Are we people who truly live by the word? And he also says there's so many blessings to obedience that we'll see scattered throughout even chapter 6. But he says that your day may be prolonged. You will live long in that land and prosperous in that land if you obey the God who loves and cares for you. Amen? But get this, it doesn't end there. It doesn't just end with you. Yes, you are to know it. Yes, you are to obey it. But he says, and thy son 
and thy son's son. And we're going to get to here in a moment this charge to parents, this charge that fathers have as spiritual leaders in their homes. But my friend, it falls on you to teach the word of God to your children. Amen? That is your responsibility. It falls on you. How else are your children going to carry on and, and, and grab the faith for themselves and carry on and teach it to their children if you stop in your generation and don't teach them? My heart's burden as I studied for this of where I think we are as believers in our nation. But again, he says, do this. You your, and your descendants, you, your kids, and your grandkids, are you teaching them the Word of God? But he also says this, all the days of your life. I'm just going to tell you, I never will outgrow the Bible. You will never get to a point where we no longer need God and His Word. We will never get to the point where we outgrow our need for the church. He's instituted the church. And we're talking about living by His Word. He wants you to, to get saved. He wants you to be baptized. He wants you to join His local New Testament church. And He wants you to faithfully grow there and serve there. That's His clear revealed Word in His, in his Bible. Amen? And we've been looking at it for, for the past several weeks here on Sunday morning. That's his will. And my friend, if we fail to do that, our kids and our grandkids are departing from the Lord. How long will it be before our kids or our grandkids never get saved and they're lost and going to hell? Because we have forgotten God. And we have forgotten to do life and church the way he commands us to. What does it say next? So, again, we do this all the days of our life. It's not just while we're young that, that we're to do this. No, every day of your life. I hope, you're grow, I hope you're closer to the Lord now than when you were first saved. More passionate about Him now than when you were first saved. I hope you know more of the will of God and are doing the will of God now than when you were first saved. I hope that if you were called upon to teach the Word... Here, or get this, you're already called to do it in your home, that you know the Word of God so well that you'll teach it. All the days of our life. Verse 3. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it. Listen to the command of God and be ready to do it. Do it that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily. If you obey God, you will see blessing in your life, and you will increase mightily, and it will be well with you. Amen? It also says, As the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Again, God made this great promise. I have this life for you. Do you want it? Enter in by faith. So what does it say next? Now we're going to jump into verse 4. But all in all, what do we see here? God has His commands for us, His will for us. He wants us to know it. He wants us to do it. And He wants us to pass it on to our children. Amen? That's the clear charge we see in verses 1 through 3. Are we taking that serious today? Do we realize our responsibility to live it? but also to teach it to our children. Verse 4 is actually, 4 through 9 is actually considered this. It's considered the great Shema of the Jews. And Shema actually means here, the great Shema of the Jews. This is actually um, seen as their basic confession of faith within Judaism. This was actually, um, Orthodox Jews even today, recite these verses as a prayer. Very important in the Word of God. And so again, let's look into this Shema. Let's look in what we have as believers to learn from this and glean from this today. Verse 4 says this. Hear what God has to say. Hear, 
O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So again, let us hear. And in that word hear, let us hear and be ready to obey. A hearing that leads to obedience was demanded of all God's people. The same with us today. When God speaks, we're here ready to do. We're not here ready to pick and choose. We're here ready to obey. But he even says this, that um, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. Let me just tell you, they were told right before this, the chapter before, he actually retaught the Ten Commandments. And let me just tell you, my friend, the Ten Commandments was in a nutshell, Christ would describe this and sum this up later, the Ten Commandments that were given to them to live by could be summed up in this, love the Lord thy God with all your, with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And also love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? This was what he was wrapping up and teaching them. But even in those Ten, com in those ten Commandments, we were seen of not having any idols before God. Not worshiping any false gods. Amen? That's part of your love to God. Well, let me just tell you, we should worship nothing else other than Him because He is the one true and living God. The Lord our God is one Lord. There's no other God, let me just tell you. Allah is not God. Um, these false idols, they're not God. They're made with hands. There's no strength. There's no power in them. But also, let's take this to heart today. Well, you may say, well, I don't worship Allah. We're good there. I don't worship false idols. We're good there. But let me also tell you, our imaginary ideas of God, we should not have that as our God either. When we pick and choose what to believe about God and His commands for us, we have false gods in our mind. Also, let us not have a watered-down version of God. There's one God. And if we really want to know who He is, it's in His Word. And we must not water it down or pick and choose. But also today, what other false gods are we called to take out of our lives? Let your job not be your God. Let your money not be your God. Let your earthly riches not be your God. Have we ever fallen into that trap? Absolutely. Are we there today? What Scripture says, my friend, is that covetousness is idolatry. Scripture also says this, my friend, you cannot serve riches and God. You can't. You may say, yeah, I can do it. Maybe some people can't, but I can. I can still love God and still love my money and my riches and what this world has to offer, but God says you can't. It's impossible. You will love one and hate the other. You'll serve one and, and reject the other. Do we know that truth today? So know this, you cannot serve two masters. So who are we serving today? Are we serving ourselves? Are we serving our riches? Scripture actually says right after telling us we cannot serve two masters, it actually tells us this, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. If we want to love, we want to trust in our riches to meet our needs and meet our wants, we'll get this. Put God first. Seek God with all your heart and the things of God. And guess what? He's going to take care of all your needs. He's promised to. And He's the good Father that will. So where are we today with that? Where is our worship today? Do we have one God in our life? The God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is that our God? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, our triune God, is that our God? Let's look to see what verse 5 says. Read with me if you will. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, 
with all thy soul and with all thy might. Again, what is he teaching us here? We're here to know that there's only one God and we're here to worship him. Amen? We're not just here to worship him. We worship him out there as well. But in our worship, why do we worship him? Why do we serve him? Out of love. If we're serving God today and it's not out of love for him, well, we missed it. We missed the point. God who has given us life. God who interceded on our behalf. God who gave his own son to die for us. Our Savior. God who gives us chance after chance. God who dedicated himself to not quit on you and keep growing you your whole life, that God. My friend, I, I hope we have come to love him. And I hope the way we live our life is, is out of love for him. It says, love the Lord thy God. Part of this great Shema. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. That's all your mind. That's all your will. Also, it says, all thy soul, and all, and all, all thy soul, that means all your being, all your desires, is to love him, obey him, please him, serve him. It also says, and with all thy might, all thy strength, all thy effort. My friend, are we here today because we love him? The way that we live our lives, the things we choose to do and choose not to do, do we do that because we love him with every fiber of our being? He's given everything to save us. Why would we hold anything back? Verse 6 says this. It says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. My friend, this is the key. This is a big key to it all. If we really, as we've already been commanded, look, here's my word for you. Here's my commands for you. I want you to live it. I want your children to live it. And I want your grandchildren to live it. Well, let me just tell you, you will never live it if you don't do what verse 6 says. That, you shall, that the word of God shall be in thine heart. We can listen to this every Sunday or whenever we show up, the Bible. But if we fail to take it to heart, don't ever expect to be living it throughout the week. Don't ever expect to be showing our children genuine faith that they can hold, up, hold on to for themselves and carry it on. Again, we could hear it, let it go out one ear and out the other and leave here unchanged. We can even come here and store up a lot of good head knowledge. There's a lot of Christians that, man, they've got a lot of that Bible in their head. But God says to take it to heart. Take it to heart and mine. Treasure it. Man, our, our hunger for the Word of God will show it if we're treasuring the word of God or not. But if we treat the word of God like I'll, I'll, I'll take it maybe when I'm free, I'll come, I'll grow maybe when I'm free or I don't have something else going on, will we show ourselves real quick if we are treasuring the word of God and are actually storing the word of God in our life and actually living it. So my friend, this is the key to living the word and actually advancing the word and the faith to our children, we got to start taking it to heart and treasuring it in our heart. So again, let's look at this next verse. This is a very key verse today, verse 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. We'll pause there for a minute. The Word of God. God has just told you and me. Store it in your heart, live it. But also teach it diligently to your children. God said that. 
my friend, this is a, again, it's not just bringing them to church and having the church teach them. This is not just occasionally just maybe mentioning God or maybe occasionally praying before, before for supper or whatever it may be. We're going to get into how deep this goes, but he says diligently teach. Give your whole heart and your whole life to teaching the word of God even to your children. Amen? We teach our kids a lot of things. We diligently teach our kids a lot of things. Things that we are passionate about, things that we love, we will diligently teach our children. But my friend, will we love the word of God and who God is and diligently accept that responsibility to teach them? The world's out there to teach them. The world does teach them. Their friends teach them. But you, who has some of the most influence in your kid's life, who spends a great deal of time with your kids, God says you, you're the one. You're the one that's to teach them of God. He also tells us uh, how to do it. It says, and shout, verse 7, we'll read on in verse 7, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy, thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. What is he saying? Look, we got to ask yourself this question. In my daily life, when I'm around my children and when I'm not around my children, is the word of God so treasured in my heart that I can't help but speak about him? He's talking about your everyday activity, everything you do, do you speak of God? And if we don't, let us be honest with ourselves today, if we don't, I guarantee you it's probably because we're failing to treasure God and His Word in our heart. And we could fix that today. Maybe we've started to love and focus too much on everything else and have forgotten God. So in everything you do and in everywhere you go, will you teach the Word of God and about God? Will you even show them practical ways in their lives of how to apply the Bible? Because let me just tell you, the Word of God is the most relevant thing in your life. It affects every area and every facet of your life. It will greatly affect every area of your life. You need to know it and your children need to know it. Otherwise, they'll think it doesn't apply. How does this apply to me? But let me just tell you. When you've treasured the word of God in your heart and you're living it, every day they're going to see just how relevant the word of God is by their own moms and their own dads. So again, is God mentioned in your home? All throughout the day is God mentioned in your home. Do you teach your children through life lessons, through things in your life? When your children are worried or scared, do you remind them of the nature and the promises of God? When you're teaching your children, are you teaching them at home with the word of God? When you're correcting your children, are you doing it with the word of God? When you're building up your children and equipping them for every good work, are you using the Word of God? My friend, let me just tell you, we're teaching our kids something about God every day. Whether it's good or bad, that's up to you. How we view the Word of God, if God's Word has any priority at our home, you're teaching them. The church service our dedication or lack of dedication to coming faithfully and growing, our dedication or lack of dedication to serving in the church, you're teaching them something. And you're going to be their greatest teacher. When we leave God out and just forget God, we're no longer coming to church anymore or we're barely coming to church anymore and we're not talking about Him at home, 
We're not reading about him at home. Guess what? We're forgetting God. And as I said earlier, how long before your kids completely forget God and your grandkids stay lost and go to hell? Yes, that is very firm. But we need to see the reality of this and how vitally important your role is in the spiritual upbringing of your children. What does it say next? What says next in um, verse 8, it says this, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and thou shalt be as frontlets between thine eyes. Let me just tell you, the Orthodox Jews took this quite literally. They had got boxes, and they strapped them on their, their hand, and they strapped them on their forehead, and they put a portion of Scripture rolled up and put it inside it, and they would recite that prayer throughout the day. Again, they took it quite literally. However, the point of what God is trying to teach here is that we are to saturate our own lives and saturate our children's lives with the Word of God. Amen? Just how saturated are you in your children's lives with the Word of God? Again, we saturate it with a lot of stuff. But the Word of God that has power to save and has power to transform, how saturated are our lives with that? He says, And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Even if you do this literally, um, a lot of Christian homes will have scriptures on the walls. That's great. We do too. Some of those favorite scriptures that we love, that we hold dear, that we put on our walls. You may put it on your screensaver, on your phone. You may put it on your binder, whatever it may be. But again, while you are in your home, here's the point. While you are in your home, because we could have them on the wall. But what, the point is, while you are in your home and while you leave outside your gate, are you reminding yourself of the Word of God? It's the Word of God on your mind, and it's therefore going to affect your life. That's the point. So again, we need to see the reality of how vitally important our spiritual dedication is to ourself, to our kids, and to our kids' kids. I'm going to read just a few more verses that's found in chapter 6. It says here, it says, verse 20, it says, And when thy son, so you've already diligently taught them the word of God, you're already living the word of God faithfully, you're putting the things of God as priority in your life, and your kids see that, and you share with them with joy. It's not that we have to do this, it's that we get to do this. So after you're doing all of these things, in verse 20 it says, and when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded? What's the meaning of all this? You ever had your kids ask you that? Why do we do church? Why do we read the Bible? If it's a specific command in God's word, what is the meaning of this? What have you told them? I hope we know. He tells us why, though. Verse 21. Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen. We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. God delivered us out of Egypt. Let me just tell you today. If your kids may be asked, why do we go to church? Why is God talked about in our home? I hope your answer is this. Let me just tell you about how God has redeemed us. Let me tell you how I, I am a sinner deserving of hell. Let me tell you how Christ intervened. 
Let me tell you how he will, willingly went to the cross and bore it all. Let me just tell you, I once did not know God. I once was lost. I once was spiritually dead. But he redeemed me. He bought me back. But again, he didn't stop there. So again, I hope you tell your children that. But it doesn't stop there. If we stop there again, there's going to be a lifetime of wandering in the wilderness. There's going to be a lifetime of wandering in the world. But it says this. Um, we also see in verse 23, And he brought us out from thence. So he took us out of Egypt. It says that we might, br uh, excuse me, that he might bring us in. To give us the land which he swore unto our fathers. He didn't just take them out of Egypt, but he was taking them to the promised land. My friend, is that why we serve? Is that why we follow the commands of God? Because we love him and we know that he redeemed me. I was once dead, but now I'm alive unto God. I, again, is that on our minds? Look, he's not just saved me to just to get me to heaven. He's done that. But he's also saved me so that I could greatly know him now. He saved me because he has good works that he has stored up beforehand for you now. He has a purpose for you and his church. Did you hear that? He has given you gifts by the Spirit of God at salvation. And He has a purpose for you in, the, in His church. That's what He saved us to. He saved us to live for Him. He saved us to live in such a way, to love Him in return in such a way, to speak of him in such a way that our children and our grandchildren would come to know him too. Amen. Let me just share with you this. There's actually been many studies. This is Father's Day. There's actually been many studies, many polls that have been done about the effects that a father has on their children. Where their fathers are spiritually. Where their father's dedication is spiritually. Where their church attendance and faithfulness is. How much it has an effect on their, on their children. And here's what these studies show. I'm going to share with you two, two areas of study. One has shown that on average, if a father does not go to church, no matter the faithfulness of the mother, only one child in 50 will become a regular worshiper when they are older. One in 50. But if he does come to church faithfully, God is priority in his life, and he's teaching that to his children. Between two-thirds and three-fourths of their children will attend church when they are adults. Right? Also, another study shows this. This one I hope will get us as well. Another study found that if a child is the first person in the household to become a Christian, that it, that it is 3.5% probability that everyone else in the household will follow. And this happens. There's times where kids are one to Christ and then their families are reached then. And their families actually know God now and their eternities are sealed now. That's great things. But only 3.5 probability that it will happen if it starts with the child. Get this. If the mother is the first to get saved, there is a 17% probability that the rest of the family will be also that's a big jump that's good and i'll just tell you across the across the globe 
Mamas are some of our, our great spiritual influencers in our family. Mamas are some of our greatest faithful attenders and servants in the church, and I am thankful. But let me tell you this. However, when the father is the first to become a Christian, there is a 93% possibility that everyone else in the household will follow. Dad's impact on the family's faith and practice is huge. I hope, I hope we heard the word of God today. I hope we see his command. His command for each and every one of us to faithfully grow in his word and faithfully live out his word. To say that today and this day forward, I'm going to serve God. Here, faithfully, and out there, faithfully. I hope we see that vital importance, but I also hope we see that other charge that daddies, mamas, we are commanded of God diligently teach your children of God and the ways of God. My friend, I hope we see just how, how much of an influence we have on our children. I, I pray that if, if we've been playing games with God, maybe we've been serving God faithfully for years, but who knows what has happened in your life, but for some reason you've, you've went away from God. For some reason, you've stopped serving God. For some reason, we're not faithful in church anymore. Maybe when church used to be a priority in our family's life, it's not anymore. Maybe we used to joyfully and passionately serve God in and through this church even. But for some reason, we aren't anymore. Maybe there was a time in our homes where we passionately and joyfully talked about God because we ourselves were entrenched in the Word of God throughout the week. And boy, how much we were teaching our kids and our grandkids. My friend, for wherever we are today, let us see ourselves clearly. God knows it. Will you see where you are today? Well, all of us, will we say today, God, I have fallen short in this area. God, I have forgotten you. God, you've not been priority. God, I've failed my children. God, I've failed my grandchildren. Maybe some of them are out of church now. Maybe some of them have completely rejected God. Maybe our grandkids have never gotten saved yet. But again, has that been influenced by where we are? Whatever it may be, my friend, I pray that we will cry out to God. Ask his forgiveness. And say this, say what Joshua said. Joshua said this in Joshua 24, same group of people. Joshua said this, choose this day whom ye will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Will you say that today? Will you mean that today? I hope we are ready to really see what God will do in and through us when we truly get ready to serve him. I'm ready to see parents and grandparents continuing to cry out in prayer praying for their own spiritual growth, praying for their own family's spiritual growth. I'm ready to see Bethel continue to grow because we have chosen today just exactly who we are going to serve, just exactly who is going to be on the throne. Will you make that decision today as our song leader, a pianist, comes?